Well, here I am in the back of our property at the ministry center of the firehouse chapel, uh, re-recording yesterday's message. Today is uh, Monday, October 7th, and yesterday's message was recorded, but I probably didn't plug the sound in properly, so therefore there was no sound. There was just me talking with nothing, which some of you might like that, but I thought very impressed that I need to re-record this message. Because this is starting a series, don't know how long the series is going to last, but I think it's a very important series, especially dealing in this time and date that we are in today. Uh, but as I opened yesterday, and I feel it's very important to state this again, uh, I started talking about, which I don't very rarely do online, but I talked about our giving, our church giving. And at the end of every quarter, and last Sunday was the last uh, Sunday of the third quarter of 2024, which blows my mind. We, since the very beginning of the firehouse, we have designated a minimum of 10% of our tithes and offerings goes to our missionaries. From the very beginning, we, we did that. And we, we have never balked at that. We have never stopped. And we just don't give 10%. That's our bottom uh, number or percentage. We've always given above and beyond that because, as my wife and I, we personally we believe in sacrificial giving. Therefore, the church believes in sacrificial giving. And I believe God honors that. So last week, I wrote a total number of checks totaling $17,000 to go to our missionaries. We have four missionaries that we support, uh, Tony and Asusena, who are in Agua Caliente, Mexico. We have Kim East, who is in Topeak, Mexico, working with Nana's house. We have Mark and Sue Schmidt, who work, their ministry is called Maranatha Ministry, and they do missions work all over Central South America and even in Europe where they train pastors and disciple people. It's, it's amazing. And then we also su support Samaritan's Purse, uh, The Greatest Journey. And you've been probably hearing a lot about Samaritan's Purse on the news. They've been reporting how they're involved in all this relief effort in Tennessee, North Carolina, Georgia, Florida, all these areas that have been impacted by the hurricane. Samaritan's Purse is there. We always help support what's called... Uh, the Greatest Journey, which goes along with what's called Operation Christmas Child. If you're not familiar with Operation Christmas Child, is every Christmas uh, we pack shoeboxes, and this is not by us, it's by churches all over the world, pack shoeboxes full of toys and gifts and stuff, and then they're shipped out all over the country and distributed through churches in various countries to kids that have nothing for Christmas. It's a great evangelistic tool. Well, along with that, so these kids not only get a shoebox full of, of toys and, and gifts and stuff, but we also do a program, they do a program called um, The Greatest Journey, which for $6 a child, the kids are discipled and taught more about Christ. They go through a 12-week course. It's awesome. They're, they're given at the end. They graduate, given a little cap and gown, given the Bible in their language. And these kids cherish this with all their heart because they're, they're in countries that very few of them have ever heard about Christ, and this is just a new just a new start for them. Well, we always support that, and we will continue to do that. But this past week, with all the, the trauma that has gone on by Hurricane Helena, and uh, Helene, I mean, and, and what Samaritan's Purse is doing, I talked with them, and I felt very impressed to that this year, or this quarter, that we should give to the relief efforts after the hurricane. And so I wrote a check for $13,000 for Samaritan's Purse to go towards disaster relief. And I, it, it's, it's just a small drop in the uh, bucket, so to speak. It's the best our church could do along with the other, you know, supporting our other missionaries. But I felt very impressed that I wanted you to hear that because I'm going to show you a uh, video. I'm hoping to be able to fit that in here. I'll probably need a fifth grader to do it. Maybe my grandson can show me how to do it. But I'm going to try to put a video in here from Samaritan's Purse. If it doesn't work and you're watching at home, <clears throat> just go to SamaritansPurse.org. And there's tons of videos showing the relief efforts that they're doing in the various cities and towns and, and states that they're helping with the flood victims. And I want you to just take a minute just to watch it and to, to ponder it and to see what you might be able to do. If you want to give uh, to Samaritan's Purse, you can go right online and donate to them. You, I mean, people have given to the firehouse for us to give to it. No offense, that's a big waste of time because then I get a check, got to deposit a check, write a check, send it. 
when you could just go online on Samaritan's Purse and donate whatever you want. There are 5013C, you'll get given credit for it. I would suggest before any other organization, give to Samaritan's Purse. It's a solid, solid organization. But I'm gonna put this video in here, right here, and then I'll come back for the rest of the sermon. The creek behind us just rose higher than it's ever come up before. It was rushing water. Houses above us were taking off the foundations. I've been here for over 50 years, but this was quite devastating. Our neighbors have a 10-day-old newborn. We were able to hold them up over our heads and passed all the children down, got them into the vehicles so we could evacuate. As we were driving out, we saw trees coming down, just praying that we could go through with our vehicles and get up to safety. When this hurricane hit, Samaritan's Purse already began posturing equipment, and we were getting ready. But we weren't quite sure it was going to hit here in Boone, North Carolina, our hometown. This is personal to Samaritan's Purse because we have lost so much here. As I look around, we've got a lot of loss. We've got a lot of destruction. People that have lost everything. The most important thing we do is to love our neighbor in the name of Jesus Christ and to bring hope where they may not have any hope. When I saw those orange shirts come onto the property, I really hadn't cried until I saw them step off that truck. The love and the compassion, the care and the concern with everything they did was just amazing. I've never experienced God's love like that. You never think that a disaster is going to happen in your area. And to be able to have them accept help from friends and co-workers in a crisis like this has just been one of the most amazing blessings. Just to be able to serve one another and love each other through that service. It's really hard to put into words even what it means to have a family of Samaritan's Purse rally around us right now. I express the deepest thank you from the bottom of our hearts that you guys showed up in the middle of one of the hardest things we've ever gone through and that you love us so well with the love of Jesus. That's what you brought and you know we're not even crying because of what we lost but as my mother-in-law says we're crying because love showed up. You are literally God's love that showed up on our property. So I thank you all for like never before, Samaritan's Purse has shown the face, the hands, and the feet of Jesus. And you can't put a price on that. There's no way to say thank you enough. It was truly amazing. You see how powerful that is. The, the destruction, the devastation <clears throat> that so many people have faced. It, it's, it's literally life-changing. Last week, we finished the series Unholy Alliances. And I believe that this new series that we're beginning is extremely timely. I always pray and ask God, Lord, please just give me wisdom of what you want said and done. What, does, what do we, and when I say we, including me, what do we need as a church body or as people serving Christ? What do we need right now to continue to serve you, to uh, exalt you, to live for you, and to, or, to help reach a broken and lost world. And I feel that right now, what we are going to be doing is today's message begins <clears throat> a series in entitled Steadfast. Steadfast. I did some looking, it wasn't very hard. I looked up what the definition of steadfast is, and here's the definition. And please hear this definition of steadfast is firmly loyal, constant, unswerving, unmovable, and unchanging. So here it is again, firmly loyal, constant, unswerving, unmovable, and unchanging. That's steadfast. Again, as I take a step back and look at all of what is going on, not just with the hurricane and the storms and please be praying for Florida and all those areas again as this new hurricane starts barreling towards uh, Florida. Uh, man, we just need to be in prayer for these people, for their protection. Um, but we need to be steadfast in our faith. And, and what I'm seeing, 
especially with the election coming up and all this other stuff. So many people are wishy-washy. They don't really know what they believe. And I want to encourage you, and the scripture that we're going to look at not only encourages us, tells us that we better be steadfast in what we know and what we believe concerning the things of God. And Paul, the Apostle Paul, who was the chief among all sinners, but also is the guy who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, he has written in Philippians to the church of Philippi, he, he wrote some pretty powerful words, encouraging them and instructing them to stay steadfast. Now, here's what happened. The church of Philippi, had the people had come to know Christ, but there was a lot of other forces around them that were trying to sway the people away from their faith in Jesus Christ. They were trying to you know, interject this, interject that, putting more religion, putting more tradition in. People were to follow this and follow that. And they were really missing the whole point of what it was to have Christ in their life as their Lord and Savior. And they were being swayed. So the Apostle Paul, being who he is and who he was, I should say, he laid it all out for the Church of Philippi. As we today need it laid out to us so that we make better choices and we live strongly for the Lord Jesus Christ. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to the book of Philippians chapter 4. And I'm going to read just now verse number 1. And this is Paul's exhortation to stand firm. Here's how it reads. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, of whom you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends friends. All right, so the Apostle Paul right there is just showing the people how much they mean to him. That, hey, listen, dear friends, I love you. I love you, so I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm going to be honest with you. It's amazing how, I don't know, are we afraid to, to tell people that we love the truth because maybe we're afraid to get rejected? But then if we hold the truth back, and I'm not saying you say it like holding a hammer, beating somebody to death with it. But if you actually tell somebody the truth and they reject it, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting the truth. But if you don't, if we don't tell the ones we love the truth, that's on us. So here the Apostle Paul is saying, listen, I love you all. I love you enough to tell you this so that you can have great joy, so that you can live out your life serving Christ. But what you have to do is you have to remain steadfast. See, when you stand steadfast, you won't be swept away. You won't be easily led astray. I related yesterday at church how, you know, working with high school students and stuff, starting out as a youth pastor, but uh, and then speaking in the schools and all these kids I've seen over the years. Um, you know, so much emphasis is put on junior high and high school, you know, that, oh, this is it, you know, and and, and so many kids think that this is their life. They're, these friends that they're making in high school are going to be lifelong friends. <laughs> so much compromise happens because people want to be accepted. Kids want to be accepted. College students want to be accepted. Adults want to be accepted. They all want to fit in. So they're going to go along with whatever. That will happen to you. You'll be swayed by that if you don't know what you believe. If you're not steadfast. Remember what the definition is. Unmovable. Unswervable. You are right there. You're staying. Nobody's going to change your mind because you know what Jesus Christ has done in and through you and for you. So therefore, you stand strong. Like next, I guess, uh, yeah, next year, it'll be my 50th class reunion. Am I going to drive back to Pittsburgh, home of the six-time world champion Pittsburgh Steelers, for my 50th reunion? No. Why? I spent four years there. The day I graduated, after I graduated, if I didn't... If I ran into 10 kids that I graduated over the years, that was that, that number's probably high. I never saw them, never had contact with them unless I stopped by. I, I remember I, we went to one of our high school reunions. I don't remember which one. And it was still the same. The same kids that hung out at the bar were still hanging out at the bar. The same kids, it was this, it was that. It was this and that. It was like for four years, we put so much emphasis on this. And kids make some really bad choices because they want to fit in. Adults make really bad choices when they want to just fit in. College students make some really bad choices when they just want to fit in because they don't know what they believe. 
I strongly believe, as Paul does is saying here to the Church of Philippi, that we need to know what we believe. So therefore, we're not going to move. See, he says here in verse number one, he says, You are my joy and my crown. Stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. This way. What way? See, that's a question that I ask. And again, you have to read all the passages, but I'm, I'm just highlighting a portion of it. When he says you stand in this way, well, what way? Paul was just simply describing to everybody how you have to stand is in the way of ways of God, not in the ways of the world. The world will tell you, if the world tells you yes, you say no. If the world says no, you say yes. If the world says this is good, it's bad. If the world says this is bad, it's good. It's complete opposites. It's complete opposites. So how I understand it, is I'm going to live my life out serving God in his principles, which are written in his word, so that I can continue to be a witness to, to others, that I can share the truth, even if it's not received. But I care enough about people that I want them to hear the truth. As somebody cared about me or somebody's cared enough about me to tell me the truth also, and therefore my life was led to Christ and it was forever changed. You know, people this past week faced such devastation from this hurricane these poor poor people it's it's true it's it's it shakes your very core and the more i see the more devastation i don't know how people are ever going to recover from this they were completely caught off guard never thinking that this would or could happen i mean who would think um it, at boone north carolina there's a college there called appalachian state or depending on where you're from, it's called Appalach Appalachia State or Appalachian State. I call it Appalachian State. When I was in college, on our way back from Florida from training, we would stop at Appalachian State and we would swim there. We would compete. They were D1. I think we were D2 college. And we would compete just like a tune-up before the season really got into full swing. It is at a very high elevation because how I know, first of all, when you got there, it was a little, you got winded really quick. Being a swimmer, they had to adjust our times because of the fact we were at such a higher altitude than we were used to. But the fact is, Boone, North Carolina is up in the mountains. So is all these other towns and communities. They're up in the mountains. Nobody ever thinks of flooding. Nobody's prepared for flooding. But yet, the floods, the water, the debris, the mud, the landscape came barreling down that mountain, caught people completely off guard. They had they were not prepared. They, they just didn't, didn't think it would ever happen, which isn't their, I mean, I'm not blaming them. They, it, I wouldn't have thought it happened. When I heard what happened, I'm like, how in the world did that happen? They're way up there. I mean, I can understand if you're living in Tampa at sea level, but 5,000 feet up in the, air, in the mountains, I don't see it. But the fact is they weren't prepared. So many lives were lost, destruction beyond more than just money. Not only did it change the landscape, which I saw one spot where a lady, poor thing, she's standing along what used to be like a road, and she's looking down maybe 30 or 40 feet. And here's all this area that's just, the water just ate it away. And she was saying, this is where my house was. And you look down, she doesn't even have her property anymore. If her deed said her property is X, X is gone. It is completely gone. The lady has nothing. That's heartbreaking. That's so heartbreaking. But see, what happens is this. It not only changed the landscape, but it changes people's lives. And this is what I got out of this. Seeing the videos of these massive walls of water and mud and debris taking and making its own pathway. I just saw destruction everywhere it went. And I'm truly reminded of how devastating and destructive a sinful life really can be. Here's the thing about sin and living a sinful life. You might be going along just fine, enjoying your sinful life. But one day, the walls are going to come crashing down. It, it, it's just going to happen. Whether it's here on this earth, or whether it's before the Lord, and you hear these words... Depart, depart from me, for I know you not. See, living a sinful life, I, I mean, I, like I related yesterday in church, I said, 
I didn't know I was a sinful person until I was exposed to the gospel. And once I was exposed to the gospel, all of a sudden I was like, wow, things were going pretty good. Now things are kind of like rattling because, ooh. And it wasn't until I surrendered and, and God brought me to my knees. And God needs to bring us to our knees. Not until I got there did I realize the freedom and the hope that I can find in Jesus Christ. That I could be finally set free. You know, we can live unaffected, unfazed in our sinful lives until destruction comes. It's funny. I tell people that I'm praying for them. And I do. I, as best as, uh, as long as I can remember, I will, I will pray for people. There's people I pray for all the time. And I often wonder, because I don't tell them exactly what I'm praying for. Them. You know, some have fought, walked away from Christ. Some haven't come to Christ yet. And I'm praying for them. Now, you might wonder, well, Pastor Steve, what, what do you pray for? And i got to be honest with you. If they, well, if they watch this, they're going to know what I'm praying for. I pray that their life gets wrecked. I pray that God comes down on them so hard that it knocks them completely down to their knees and they can only the only thing they can do is look up for their salvation draweth near. Because the fact is, if I'm praying God blesses them in their sinful life, I'm not doing them any favor and they're not being done any favor. They, we all have to come out of our sinful life into the new life in Jesus Christ. And I, 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 I'm not praying that to be mean. I'm praying that because that's what has to happen. People have to get to the place where I, you go, I, I, Lord, I, I surrender. Lord, I'm I, not me anymore. I surrender. I, I give up. I can't do this. I have to fall on your grace and your mercy and your love and your forgiveness. I have to. So see, Paul is encouraging people here in uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 1. Paul says to be steadfast in our faith in Christ. Not just though so we can stand in our faith, but that we can actually live differently by the blood of Jesus Christ, unattached from the sinful world and its practices. You know, it's interesting. I, I got an image when I wrote this down on my holy yellow legal pad. I got this image where Paul's exhorting us to allow God to set us free. And, you know, there's songs written about the chains of sin who have bound us. And I, I did some research back, you know, back in the days, like when Paul was thrown into prison, he was shackled. The shackles were cha iron chains with shackles on the end of it. And the chains were embedded into the rock that was in the prison. And he was shackled to the prison. He was shackled to the actual walls of the prison. And, and the, the world had, had engulfed, had bound him. The chains were, were connected to the world. He couldn't be set free. And the same way with, you know, any, the slave ships, they were, people were bound the entire trip, chained to the ship, chained to this world. And, the, and the, they weren't going to see freedom. The world engulfs us, chains us, uh, tethers us to this world. And yet we go along thinking that we're in control. We're not in control. You're not in control if you're not living your life for Jesus Christ. The world is in control of you. Now, once you give up your control and you give your life to Jesus Christ, you live your life for him, but that's your choice. The world doesn't give you a choice. Once you step into the world, the world gets you, chains you, tethers you, keeps you right where they want you, and they, it, living in a delusion that somehow, some way, everything's just fine. That's not the case. It'll engulf you, and it'll ruin you. So I want you, if you have your Bibles, to turn now to Philippians chapter 3. Paul gives instruction here in Philippians chapter 3 on what we need to really do. He explains so clearly that if we are going to be steadfast in our faith, that only when we fully trust in God will we ever be truly free. When, it, when we give up on our flesh, when we say no more, then we'll be truly free. So here, Philippians chapter 3, verse number 1 says, Further, my brothers and my sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same thing to you again, and it is a safeguard to you. So let's break that down. First of all, it says, Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. When was the last time you just took time to rejoice in the Lord? Rejoice in the fact that you're saved, that you're born again, that your life has changed. 
Every day we should take some time and just thank the Lord for the gift of salvation. For while we were yet still sinners, Christ died for us. I was lost in my sin. I was blind. I couldn't see. But now I see. My eyes are open. My ears are open. My heart is clean. We need to start to rejoice rather than complain. We need to rejoice rather than say, look what God did when he really didn't do anything that he's being blamed for. But Paul's saying, this is a key. Be rejoiceful in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard to you. Now, I said yesterday, um, I felt convicted when I read that because oftentimes as a pastor, and you know, we've been in ministry 43 years, so it's a long time. Um, you know, you, you, you don't want to just keep sharing the same past scripture again. You know, people are like, ah, oh, he's going to share the same thing, and I want something new. Well, first of all, let me tell you something. God hasn't done anything new since he closed this Bible. And what I mean by that, he's given new life to those who accept him. But God isn't going to do something new that's way out of, way out of the preview of what he's done before. Everything God does is right here in the Word. There's a lot of false teaching out there, a lot of false prophets out there, a lot of false pastors out there talking about the new thing. What it really is is an emotional high, and it's only going to lead people down the wrong path. But I felt convicted because I'm like, man, I, I, I know I've spoken on this passage probably many times. I, I, but, but yet, have you ever read the Bible, read the, read the same passage, and one time it really didn't hit you, but then the next time you read it, it's like zing. That's God's Holy Spirit trying to speak through his word to your heart. Well, when I read this part, it, it, was, it really spoke to me saying, as he wrote, he says, it's no trouble for me to write the same thing to you again. And it is a safeguard to you. Repetition is the way we learn. I, I made a joke yesterday. Well, it wasn't a joke. It's actually true. Uh, usually my daughter uh, makes announcements or there's announcements made. We have announcements up on the board. Uh, we send out emails about announcements. So it, it, it never fails. Uh, Alexis will make some announcements or whoever's doing them will make an announcement in church. Later that day or the next day or whatever, whenever the event was supposed to be or whatever happened, I get a text. Hey, pastor, is this, is something happening this week? Is this what's going on? And I look at him and go, you were in church. What was, were you not listening? And the fact of the matter is they weren't. Uh, they were probably, you know, their, their minds were elsewhere. They weren't really listening. So repetition helps us learn and to take in things. Uh and, and repetition, as Paul's saying here, he says, I don't mind writing this again and again because you need it. It's a safeguard. I, I related this to you, to, to the congregation yesterday. When I was in college swimming, um, I was a sprinter. I did the 50 yards, 100 yards, and often sometimes I would do the 200-yard freestyle. But I was a sprinter. That 50 yards is two lengths, 100 yards four lengths, uh, 200 is eight lengths. That's all I did. My coach in college would have me swim Every day, 15 to 17,000 yards a day. 5 a.m. would do 7,000 yards before, before any classes started. We'd do 7,000 yards, go to class, uh, uh, be in the gym at 3, lift for an hour, then be back in the water by 4, and do another 8,000 yards a day. I'm a sprinter, and I'm swimming thousands of yards. I'm not doing the, the 500. I'm not doing the 1,000. I'm not doing the 1650 or 1750. I'm not doing any of that. I'm just swimming 50, 100, and maybe a 200. So I'd say to my coach, because man, I, you know, I'm a sprinter. I, I just, it would just tear me up. And I'd say, why in the world are you making me do all these yards? And he goes, it's very simple. He says, I want to get you tired. I said, well, you definitely have accomplished that. I'm, I'm exhausted. He goes, no, no. The reason I want you tired is because when you're tired, if you have any bad habits, like how your hand's going to end, your kick, your body shape in the water, whatever, you're going to start to lean that way you're, because it's easier. You're going to start to fade back to your old ways. And what I want to do is while you're tired, I want to watch you. I want to instruct you. I want to tell you, hey, you're doing it wrong. Get back. Get your head back in. Look at what you're doing. You need to be exhausted so you, so you train through it. And I looked at that and I said, man, that's, that's what Paul was saying here. He goes, listen, I don't mind saying this to you again because we need to hear this. We need to hear we need to be steadfast. We need to hear that we need to be unmovable. We need to hear that we're going to be unshakable. We need to hear that and that we're not going to put our confidence in our flesh 
but we're going to rejoice in the Lord for he is our strength. He's our rock, our fortress, and our high tower. In him, I put my hope, faith, and trust. The psalmist wrote about that. So as Paul writes this here in, in, in this Philippians chapter 3, verse 1, he says, I'm, I'm writing this for you. I'm writing this because I've walked through it, meaning Paul. I, I've dealt with issues, I, hardships, but yet I'm telling you, this is what to do. So this series about being steadfast, we're, we're going to be hanging out in Philippians chapter 3, is about making our faith secure, making our, 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 our faith grow so that we're not swept away by the next trend or by the next uh, trial that comes our way, that our faith, no matter what comes our way, we will stand firm and stand firm in Jesus Christ. So that's what it is. That's why I felt the urgency that I needed to re-record this back here and the way back with the squirrels and I don't know what's running around those woods, but, hmm. but I'm just saying, this is something that we need to do. I pray for you. I want to give you the opportunity as I do every week. If you don't know Christ in your life, I would like to pray with you and give you the opportunity to recite the prayer so that you can begin the journey. And that's our prayer for you is that you'll come to know Jesus Christ in your heart as your Lord and Savior, and you'll be forever changed. So if you'd like to pray that with me, pray right now, Lord Jesus, I come to you and I surrender. I give you my heart, my life, my soul, and my spirit. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. Make me brand new. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.